I'm going to talk about this work, which is you can find in three pa in three papers. This first one is mostly about like the the bed inequalities. Then the second one is a bit more like mathematical, let's say. It's about like Hadamard matrices of quaternions and stuff like this. If this is something you're interested in, then the last one is kind of back to bell inequalities and trying to like tackle the the MUB problem that I will tell you about through bell inequalities. So first, I will start with mutually unbiased bases or MUBs, which are not the same as mutually unbiased measurement. Keep in mind. So these are two orthogonal bases on, on finite dimensional Hilbert space such that the overlaps between any two vectors from the different bases are uniform. So this is a very nice and symmetric. You can think of examples as the, the eigenbases of the generalized Z and X operators like the uh, clock and shift. And uh, because of the unitary freedom, you can always kind of choose the first one to be your computational basis, right? And the second one, in the computational basis, the only thing that matters is these phases. So if you now collect these phases in a matrix, this gives you what is called a complex Hadamard matrix. So every element is a unit complex number, and it's, it's, an, it's like an unnormalized unitary, basically. So this will be kind of useful later for, for, for characterization reasons. Um, and an important, well, maybe not important, but a long-standing open problem uh, regarding these objects is how many of these bases you can find in a given dimension that are pairwise unbiased. And it's known that you can have at most d plus 1 in dimension d. And uh, this is saturated in prime power dimensions, but in composite dimensions it's, it's not really known. So like first dimension that is composite, it's 6. We know that there are at least 3, at most 7. But in between these, it's not really known. No one's found the fourth one since, I don't know, for, for 30 years or so. We know that it can't be six. So it's either three, four, five, or seven. So this is like the, the billion dollar problem. It's actually, actually there is, a, there is a, a prize for this, but it's only like 2,023 euros, I think, at the moment. <laughs> But if you wait for next year, it's 2024. So you know it might be it might be worth waiting, <laughs> solving this problem. That's below inflation. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, they're nice and symmetric, but also people use them in quantum info, like the corresponding measurements, the projections onto the onto these bases. They are widely useful in, in quantum info. You can find them in like Bell inequalities. You will see quantum communication, state determination, and and so on. And the reason. I think, or I feel that they are useful is because of this complementarity property, which is basically just an alternative definition of, of the basis. So you can think of two MUBs as two projective measurements on, on d-dimensional Hilbert space, such that if you have a state that gives you a definite outcome on one of the measurements, then the other measurement will give you a completely uniform output, and like the other way around. So this is this kind of complementarity property. If you can measure one of the, the observables corresponding to these measurements uh, like perfectly, like you get a definite outcome, then the other one will give you a, a uniform outcome. So this gives you kind of uh, advantages in many sort of quantum information processing tasks. Uh, so we will use this again later, this kind of alternative definition. But before that, I will talk about like some of the use of MUBs in quantum info. And we will look at it in the, through the lens of Bell non-locality. Mm -hmm. So if you saw my previous talk, it's almost the same slide, but uh, it's a bit shorter. I don't know, maybe. So OK, going back, going back. So on Bell non-locality, we're thinking of two parties, Alice and Bob. They are performing some sort of actions. So each of them have some inputs from some classical sets. And uh, given an input, they just sort of press a button on the box. They get some kind of outcome, which is also a classical from like a finite alphabet. Bob does the same, and they are not allowed to communicate during the, during the experiment, but they might share some sort of correlations. For example, they could share quantum correlations in the form of a, of a bipartite quantum state, and then we can define the quantum set of correlations, which is just the probabilities with which you can obtain these outcomes A and B, given the settings X and Y. And the way you can, you can obtain this quantumly is by sharing this bipartite state and measuring some kind of P or VM elements. And all of this gives rise to the, to the quantum set of correlations, which is a convex set. And I just stress it here that there is no dimension restriction here. So anything you can write in this form, even if these are infinite dimensional, let's say, 
this is still part of the set. And this is how it becomes a, a convex set. Now there's another interesting set, which is the local set, which you can write in this form. So you imagine that there is some kind of classical common cause, this lambda. When you condition on lambda, the, the outcome of Alice only depends on her input, and Bob's uh, outcome only depends on his input. And they kind of factorize in this way. And then you average over this lambda, which is this hidden variable, to get the, the eventual correlation. So everything you can write in this form is called local. This also forms a convex set. It's, in fact, a convex polytope. And it's strictly included in, in the quantum set. This is like Bell's theorem. So you can achieve more quantumly than you can sort of classically. And the way to witness this, this, in, this strict inclusion, is usually done through Bell inequalities which are essentially linear functionals on these, on these correlations. So I can define a Bell functional, this beta, with some like real coefficients. I, have, I take a linear combination of, of, these, of these probabilities. Now, quantumly, it, it will be useful to define you, these Bell operators. So the, the quantum value you get is via the trace of the shared state with some operator i which we will call the bell operator. So it's basically just the same stuff. You just plug the operators in. And once you take the trace with the state, you get the, the quantum value. And uh, we can define the maximal quantum value and the maximum classical value, which is just taking the maximum of the functional over the respective sets. And then the way to witness bell non-locality is through a bell inequality, which is this kind of red inequality. So each, each local correlation must satisfy the red inequality but then if the maximal quantum value is strictly larger, then I can violate this inequality with some quantum state in measurement. And this is a witness of the correlations being non-local. So these are, these are Bell inequalities. And now we are going back to MUBs through Bell inequalities. And we define, in, in this paper, we define a family of Bell inequalities for any integer d greater than 2 for MUBs of dimension d. So in Bob's side, you have these two measurements with d outcomes each. These will be your MUBs optimally. And then, OK, analysis side, you get these like d squared measurements with three outcomes each. It's not like super important what it is, but nevertheless, I will put the bell operator on. Um, I'm not sure if I should explain this kind of, but you know, these are the, the two MUB operators from the two different bases. You take the, the difference of these projections. And then you, you find kind of matching operators analysis side that, that try to like find the, the two non-trivial eigenvectors of this operator. This is kind of the idea. Um, and then this other term is just there because if the dimension is greater than two, you don't really want to. So here you see that only the first two outcomes appear. You don't always want to just out output these guys. Sometimes you want to output the third one, which is just a projection on the, kind of the rest of the Hilbert space. And we have this kind of penalty term to take care of that. It's not very important. What's important is if you get, we can find the maximal quantum value for every D, which is this. And if you achieve this maximal quantum value, this certifies some algebraic relations of Bob's measurement operators. And these are of this nicer uh, sandwich form. So it's like B0, B1, B0. Uh, this is ex exactly what it certifies. And importantly, MUBs satisfy these relations. So if you start plugging in like projections onto two MUBs, then it's, you can convince yourself fairly quickly that this, is, this will be satisfied. So MUBs maximally violate this Bell inequality. Now I will kind of change notation so it's, it's a bit nicer. So these were the relations for two measurements, P and Q, that were certified in, in this Bell scenario. And uh, we call measurements satisfying these relations mutually unbiased measurements, or MUMs. And uh, we can show that this definition is equivalent to this definition. I take two projective measurements. The only difference between this uh, alternative MUB definition in, in terms of complementarity is that now I don't assume the dimension of the Hilbert space. So it's kind of a device-independent definition of MUB-ness, if you wish, right? I don't, I, st I still have these kind of operational relations, right? If I have a definite outcome on one measurement, then the other measurement will give me a uniform outcome. But I don't say anything about the dimension of the Hilbert space. So this is kind of why it's, it's useful in these, in these device-independent scenarios. So we find that, yeah, these, these two definitions are, are equivalent. And later, we also found that 
this le this latter definition was u was introduced in this paper where they were looking at they call them coarse grained neutral and biased bases. They, they look at kind of continuous variable measurements with uh, with these relations. So you can also find this there. So right, we have this definition, and uh, actually, if you just look at this kind of algebraic uh, definition, you will find that they share many properties with MUBs. These measurements, you get the same entropy uncertainty relations, you get the same like measurement incompatibility robustness as MUBs. So they really seem to behave very much like MUBs. Um, so then, it, in order to kind of find to what extent they are the same as MUBs, we give a characterization. So whenever you have a pair of measurements that satisfy these, these MUM relations, then the Hilbert space must be a multiple of, the, the dimension must be a multiple of D. Okay, I, I assume that the, the total Hilbert space is finite dimensional. So it must be a multiple of D, and okay, I can always choose the first measurement to be kind of uh, some rank one projection on the first Hilbert space and identity on the second one. And then what we find is that the other measurement must take this form. So it's basically the other measurement is defined by d squared unitary operators on this, on this r dimensional Hilbert space, the second factor. And if you collect these unitaries in a block matrix, this will be essentially what we call the Hadamard matrix of unitaries. So if you plug back in uh, r equals 1, so the total Hilbert space is of dimension d, you, you really get back the MUB definition. And these unitaries will be just like you know one-dimensional unitaries. These are, the, these are the phases from the original MUB definition. So right, again, we see that there's a, there's a similarity. Like if you, if you fix the dimension, you really get MUBs. And here's a nice example for like dimension more than one, right? So you, you plug like the Pauli matrices in here. This is a this is a Hadamard matrix of unitaries. If you wanted to see such a such a thing, um, right? So we looked at like how they are similar to MUBs, but what we find is that um, using this characterization of Hadamard matrix of unitaries, we have a, a really nice characterization of. MUMs that are direct sums of MUBs. This is kind of the first like, natural class you can think of that will satisfy these relations. And they are not like exactly MUBs, but well, if you take direct sums of MUBs, this is not really a, a very interesting thing, right? It's, uh, it's kind of trivial that this will, this will also satisfy the MUM conditions. And what we find is that direct sums of MUBs correspond to MUMs where all these unitaries in this, in this Hadamard matrix of unitaries commute, which, OK, you see it's not the case in this, in this example. And uh, OK, so this must hold in what we call the canonical form. You can always find the canonical form of these, of these mutualized measurements by bringing the first row and column to just identities. Right? So then we find that if the outcome number is at least 4, there exist MUMs that are not direct sums of MUB. So in this sense, they are sort of really different. Like you, you can you can come up with like these high-dimensional, weird-looking measurements that are not. You cannot write them as, as direct sums of MUBs. And we have a sort of systematic construction through quaternionic Hadamard matrices. Like you can map quaternions to unitaries of, of dimension two, and then there exists like some results on quaternionic Hadamard matrices. So we can construct these kind of interesting MUMs. In, in many dimensions, really. We can actually even find MUMs that not just cannot write it as direct sums of MUBs, but also you cannot map them to MUBs with any sort of uh, um, completely positive unital map. So they're really kind of a more general notion. Right, so they're, they're different also in the sense that, as I told you at the beginning, in dimension D, you can find at most D plus one MUBs, but these MUMs, if you now you fix the outcome number to be D, you can find as many as you want if you start increasing the dimension. And I can even tell you how. You just take these, these n uh, unitaries. You just build them from the generalized x and z operators. And these will have some like degenerate eigenspaces. So you can, you can take your MUMs to be like the projections onto these degenerate eigenspaces. You will find that any two of these, uh, of these unitaries satisfy this kind of commutation relation, which is the same as the commutation of x and z. And OK, for these, it's known, for example, in this paper, that they're unitarily equivalent to z and x times identity. So 
they will satisfy the MUM conditions pairwise. So really you can, if you start like kind of increasing the dimension, you add more tensor factors, you can find as many as you want for a given outcome number. So now, well, if I, if I want to solve the, the like MUB existence problem through these guys, I know that I, I need to, if I really want these two notions to be the same and the two questions to be the same, I need to restrict my dimension to be also D. Otherwise, I will always find as many as I want. But we can still try to do that and come back to our bell inequalities and try to use these bell inequalities to, to find or, or disprove uh, MUB existence. So I just put back the same bell operator as I had. Remember, this was for, for a pair of MUBs. Now we kind of promote this inequality to, to a set of n MUBs. And it's fairly easy. You just like add n settings for Bob instead of two. And for each pair, you add uh, these square settings for Alice, and you just kind of add up the, the, the resulting bell operator. So you have this like n choose two, the sum of n choose two bell operators here. And this is maximally violated in dimension D if and only if the operators of Bob are MUBs. If I don't put this dimension D here, it's violated if and only if all of these guys are MUMs, but these you can always find. So this, you, I mean, well, you can always maximally violate it. You can always get, get like this value, but it's not that interesting from like the MUB problem uh, point of view. So I need to put in this dimension constraint, but then if I do that, well, basically the question of finding n MUBs in dimension D is the same as trying to optimize this bell functional, which is defined by this bell operator in a fixed dimension. So we're trying to maximize this, and this is what, we, what we're attempting in this, in this work. So you've, yeah, you've, you're trying to find the maximum. Well, you can, you can try to find lower bounds. It's not that easy. So we use some heuristic optimization techniques. We use like three different methods like Monte Carlo, CISO, SDP, and some kind of nonlinear SDP techniques. To, to try to find the maximal value of this of this bell functional. And in this table, you have these uh, kind of normalized difference. So whenever you see zero, this means that basically we did find this, the maximal value corresponding to n MUBs in dimension D. So all of these cases are known, right? Up to dimension five, everything is kind of known. So the other three methods kind of correctly identify the cases that are known. These ones exist. These ones don't exist very good. Then we apply it also in dimension six, where this case, the six, in four MUBs in dimension six, this is the kind of unknown case. Well, because these are lower bounds and these are heuristic optimization techniques, this will not give you a proof unless it finds you MUBs, which, which, which they didn't. But at least the three techniques com seem to converge to kind of the same set of bases. So, well, it gives you some kind of confidence, a bit of evidence that maybe they don't exist. Uh, but okay, people have been trying to solve this for many years now, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't see too much into this. But anyways, they, they do not find you more MUBs. And one of our methods, we can also run on the, ten, the next composite dimension 10 for four MUBs. And again, we didn't really find any, any new MUBs. So okay, with this technique, we as uh, humans are probably more convinced that they don't exist here. But if you want to actually prove that, you need to find upper bounds on the Bell inequality in a fixed dimension. And this is something you can, you can try to do with this so-called Moroder hierarchy of, of semi-definite programs. You can find it in this paper. Also, Christian was talking about this yesterday. So this is a hierarchy of semi-definite programs that gives you an upper bound on the Bell inequality. And you can plug in an extra constraint on the, on the entanglement negativity of the shared state. So because in a fixed dimension, the entanglement negativity is also, it has an upper bound. If I, if I run this optimization with this bound on the entanglement negativity, I'm like effectively optimizing in a, in a fixed dimension. And well, numerically, we managed to run it in dimension two for four MUBs, but at least in this case, it, it, it kind of verifies what we know already that there are no more than three MUBs. Um, then as you start kind of moving up to higher dimensions and more bases, this becomes really big. Like, I'm not I'm sure if you, if you remember, but like the, the number of settings of Alice, especially, it, it, it kind of blows up with the dimension and the, number of, and the number of measurements. So this is kind of the only thing we could run numerically. The kind of good thing about this hierarchy is you can also try to tackle it analytically if you look at the, the dual SDP. So, okay, I don't know if, you, if you're kind of familiar with this, like, 
if you think about the standard like NPA hierarchy of SDPs, which is okay, it's again gives you an upper bound on better inequality violations, but no dimension restriction. The dual SDP to this would be a sum of squares decomposition. And for our inequalities, actually, we do have a sum of squares already on, on the first level of the hierarchy. So this we understand very well. Now this Moroder hierarchy is a bit different because you have this extra negativity constraint, but still it, it, it looks very similar to the NPA hierarchy. So the dual of this, well, it again kind of looks like a sum of squares decomposition with like some extra freedom that you can, extra constraints you can have actually. No, extra freedom. And uh, well, the kind of hope is that we can look at that, look at the sum of squares decomposition we already have and try to kind of find something analytic and maybe, maybe tackle the problem in this way. Okay, this is kind of a big ask, but also on the way, this, uh, these kind of techniques would give us tools to, to find analytic upper bounds on, uh, on bad inequalities in a fixed dimension through the dual of this, of this SDP hierarchy. Right, so I will, I will have a summary slide now. So I was mostly talking about MUBs and their importance and the MUB problem and so on and that we found better inequalities for MUBs, and uh, it actually certifies a larger class of measurements, which we call MUMs. These MUMs have a nice interpretation of like being complementary in, a, in like a device-independent fashion, which makes them sort of very you know, operationally relevant, and they have a nice characterization in, this, in these Hadamard matrices of unitaries, with which we can, we can uh, characterize direct sums of MUBs. We also find that we have an unbounded number of MUMs for a given outcome number. So this, is, this makes them sort of very different from MUBs. But we're still trying to kind of tackle the, the MUB problem through these bad inequalities that we found. Um, so we're trying to like um, find the maximum of our bad inequalities in a given dimension. We found some lower bounds with heuristic numerics, which okay didn't find new MUBs, so kind of more or less verifying what we already what we already expected, and we are working towards upper bounds through this Moroder hierarchy, either numerically or maybe even like analytically. And that is all. Thank you for your attention. Go with Alistair first. Thanks for the very nice talk. Um, so. I kind of have a two-part question. I, don't, I think I kind of missed why you use this Marauder hierarchy. Is it just because you wanted to bound the dimension? Yeah. And if so, why didn't you use, say, the NV hierarchy, which I guess is a more standard way to do this? Yeah, because we, we're non-standard. <laughs> we tried that too. Um, so numerically, this also gives you... So numerically, it behaves very similarly. It also rules out four MUBs in dimension two. I think it actually is scaled a bit worse. I'm not sure about that. Um, and then if you want to do something analytically, this, I don't know how to do that with the, with the NV hierarchy because you have this kind of random sampling of the, of the moment matrices. Maybe you can do something, I don't know if anyone kind of looked into that, like do these bases exist analytically so you don't have to actually like generate them randomly. We thought a bit about this, but I don't think it's easy to do. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks. So mostly it's just for the analytic uh, side of it that you really want to Instance For me, numerics. yes. Okay. I didn't code the numerics, but the, the people who did, I think they claimed that it's actually better with the Moroder. And we, when we saw that we have a bit more chances of trying to do, trying to do that yeah. in higher dimensions than the NV hierarchy. And, and can you use or exploit symmetries with this hierarchy like you would with NV? Okay. Yes, okay. and we did, and it's still not enough. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> Well, I was curious about this when you mentioned at the end about the um, looking at the dual SDP and it seems like it'd be quite complicated with this extra negativity constraint. If I think there's like, you know, Lagrangian uh, parameters associated with each of the kind of constraints, it would look really, yeah, how can you, <laughs> I can imagine reading off some of these summer squares with the normal kind of MPA or something, but in this case, it seems like it has these extra constraints which look ugly. Yeah, so so far, mostly what we've done is look at the, at the so in the Moroder hierarchy, you can also have a PPT constraint, which is kind of the first step. If you put the negativity to zero, basically, uh -huh. but then 
this really simplifies the whole STP because it's like really a, an NPA hierarchy ah, and you require okay. the moment matrix to have a positive partial transpose. Sure, sure. And then this really gives you just kind of two terms in your dual. One is, a, is an SOS. Yeah. Another one yeah. is an SOS partially transposed, essentially. So then, and then, okay, for the, for the negativity one, yeah, now you start to have like, you need three moment matrices and you have a, a scalar constraint on one of them. But uh, okay, as far as I, I worked out the, the, the dual, it's, you can still find some SOS-like terms in it. But yeah, at this point, it, it's also like, we don't have a systematic way of even dealing with the PPT version. So we're kind of starting with that and see what, where you can go. I thought there was another question. Okay. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Mate again. So today, yeah, I want to talk to you about this idea that I'm calling uh, intermediate determinism um, and also using uh, this idea as a potential axiom for deriving quantum theory. Um, so what is intermediate determinism? So uh, possibly you are aware that quantum theory isn't deterministic. So, <laughs> I know, revelation. Uh, so, if you were to um, calculate, so you can only calculate the probability uh, of a measurement outcome, right? You can't know with certainty which outcome of a measurement will occur. And you calculate it with the, the Born rule. But uh, it's not completely lacking in deterministic measurement events. So, if your system is in some state A, and this is the eigenstate uh, of some observable, then uh, the Born rule again tells you that the probability of seeing uh, the event that A is equal to this eigenvalue A is 1. Okay, so you have a deterministic measurement event. Uh, and then there's a nice way that you can describe the relationship between the deterministic part of quantum theory and the indeterministic or probabilistic part. Uh, and that's basically that if you know all of the deterministic events, then that tells you the probability of seeing any of the other uh, indeterministic events, right? So, uh, in this uh, example here, um, this state A is the only state for which this event uh, described by this projection will occur with probability 1. So, if you know that this event will occur um, with certainty, then you know the state of the system. And if you know the state of the system, you know the probability of any other uh, measurement event occurring. Um, so, this is the idea that I'm calling intermediate determinism. Um, and it, it's basically telling you that all the information about the probabilities can be encoded within the deterministic part of the theory. So, somehow, this is fundamental to the theory. Um, okay, yeah, and this is assuming you're in a pure state. Um, so then what, uh, what I'm looking at is imposing intermediate determinism as uh, an extra axiom on top of some existing frameworks for general physical theories. Um, so in the first case, um, we're looking at the um, uh, lattices of properties, or also known as propositional systems, the sort of equivalent. Um, and then I have some little spoilers on the right. So uh, in this case, we'll impose intermediate determinism and some little helper axiom. And uh, Gisanne, uh was responsible for this originally. And we're going to find that so maybe this is very promising, but in some sense, it's a little bit too restrictive as, a, as an axiom. So then uh, what I did in this work was instead went to the framework of general probabilistic theories uh, and impose intermediate determinism there. Uh, and we're able to find a sort of geometric characterization of the GPTs which satisfy intermediate determinism. Uh, but in this case, now we're going to be too broad. So before we were too restrictive and now we're too, not restrictive enough. So then the final thing I'll talk to you about is trying to take a combination of these two approaches, which is something that I'm working on now. Uh, and I'll tell you kind of the first results of that. And maybe we can meet in the middle and find quantum and classical uh, theories. Um, so I'll try and give a sort of high level uh, 
broad overview uh, of the case for the property lattices. Um, so the idea behind a property lattice is that you imagine like what all the possible properties of a physical system could be and then you impose some mathematical structure on those. So for example you say that they should form a partial order where property K is less than property L means that uh, property A, uh, property K implies property L, right? So this will be a partial order on your set of all properties. And with uh, some sort of reasoning that goes along these lines, um, you can arrive at uh, this, what I'm calling like a, the standard um, structure for properties, which is that this, this partial order is a lattice, which is complete and orthomodular. It's not super important what that means. Uh, and for example, this, you can find this in the book of Piron. Um, so now that you have some structure for what the properties of a system uh, should uh, look like, then you can think about what the states of the system would be. Uh, and we're just going to say that the, the states tell you the probabilities of having any one of these given properties. And they do that in a way that is consistent with how we built this structure. Um, so we'll say that they're a probability measure on the property lattice. Um, so I'm calling this the kind of the standard structure. So then on top of that, we add intermediate determinism. Uh, and what, what does that mean? So now that means that the pure states of our system, uh, instead of being any one of these probability measures, they have to be a measure which has a unique set of actual properties. So actual properties are the ones that uh, the system will have with certainty, right? So they're the the actual properties of the system. Um, so then inter intermediate determinism restricts your pure states to being these measures that you can uniquely identify by uh, their actual properties. So then uh, Gizan adds like uh, a, a helper axiom, which is that every property uh, should be an actual property for some state. And when he combines all these three, it's possible, but not still not known <laughs> that this restricts you to being either in classical or quantum physics uh, if the lattice is uh, of a certain size. Um, but even if this turns out to be true, it's actually too restrictive in some sense in that it rules out uh, quantum theory in dimension two. And this is uh, related to the lack of Gleason's theorem in dimension two. Um, so then the idea was uh, to go to general probabilistic theories instead, uh, kind of using this Gleason theorem connection, because maybe you know there's like a, uh, a Gleason theorem that does hold uh, when you think about POVMs uh, and it holds in dimension two. So um, for general probabilistic theories, every system uh, has a state space S and an effect space E, and they are convex subsets of some real vector space uh, and the effects just describe the different possible outcomes of measurements. And then you find the probability of a given outcome by taking the inner product between the state vector and the effect vector. So I've drawn out uh, an example of a GPT system here, and this is a, a classical bit, and it has a state space which is a line, uh, an effect space given by this square. And so uh, a measurement in this system would just be given by some uh, collection of points from this square uh, that sum to the unit effect, which is the analog of like the identity in quantum theory. Um, so now what does intermediate determinism mean in this scenario? So first we can look at it as a feature of a pair of like uh, an effect space and a state space. You can ask, do they have intermediate determinism? So this would mean that each extremal state um, has a unique, unique set of actual effects, so effects that occur with probability one. So then in order to specify the state, you would only need to write down like this list of effects that occur with probability one. Um, and this, uh, like with the property version, is satisfied by classical and quantum GPTs. But second, we can think of it uh, as we were doing on the previous slide for properties as an axiom from which to derive classical and quantum. Um, oh yeah, effects that occur with certainty. Uh, so now uh, in this, um, what we would do here is you define a state as a probability measure on the GPT effect space 
in analogy to how states were probability measures on our property lattices before, and then impose intermediate determinism to say that the pure states should be the, the measures amongst these probability measures that have a unique set of actual effects, so they can be specified by their actual effects. Um, and then the advantage of this is that we no longer rule out um, quantum theory in dimension two, which is related to like Bush's Gleason theorem holding in dimension two uh, for POVMs. Um, but uh, it actually holds much more generally than just for classical and quantum GPTs, right? So we haven't like derived quantum theory uh, and classical from just one <laughs> simple axiom. Um, so in the paper, uh, I give a kind of geometric um, characterization of the GPTs, which uh, satisfy intermediate determinism. One of the um, uh, conditions holds on the state space and the other on the effect space, and they are necessary and sufficient for intermediate determinism. Um, so now I move on to the final thing, which is what uh, I'm currently working on. So we try to combine these two approaches to kind of hopefully meet in the middle, um, but it's, I only have some initial results so far. So I'll just tell you what that is. Um, so to, com to combine these approaches, we start with the GPT framework, and then we need to define what we would mean by a property in a GPT framework, uh, uh, in a GPT. Um, so to do that, uh, I'm using this axiom here uh, to say that every property can be measured without performing a mixture of measurements of other properties. So in some sense, they have to be pure or extremal. Um, and this would basically mean that the properties in your GPT correspond exactly to the extremal points of the effect space. And this is true in quantum theory, right? If you look at the extremal points of your, the quantum effects, you get the projection lattice. Um, so then if we combine this axiom with the kind of the two assumptions uh, we were using before, that states should be probability measures, but now we require them to be a probability measure on the effect space, but also when you restrict them just to the extremal effects to also be a probability measure on this property lattice. And then we add intermediate determinism, which says that the pure states should be measures with unique sets of actual properties. So yeah, uniquely defined by the deterministic part. Um, so these are my uh, assumptions and I've trialed them so far just on a small family of GPTs. So uh, maybe you've seen them before. It's this family of GPTs where each system has a polygon uh, as the state space. And then I've drawn the effect spaces underneath. Um, and if you do, if you impose these axioms on top of this family, what you find is the only two that satisfy these axioms are the case of the triangle and the circle. Uh, the triangle is a, a trit system, like a classical trit, uh, and the circle is a rebit, which is like a subset of quantum theory. Okay, so so far this has worked out well, but there's still like a lot to do. <laughs> um, and the only reference I know uh, for combining uh, the GPT-ish framework with the, the kind of propositional framework is this work uh, by um, Foulis, uh, Foulis uh, Randall and Piron. So uh, if you know any more references for this, uh, I'm asking for your help now, <laughs> please, please tell me. Um, and also thanks for listening. <laughs>
Okay, and yeah. It, so this kind of looks like uh, this extra axiom of Jizan, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Maybe. Yes. Well, but uh, then I think it's the opposite. Essentially, the idea is that. Um, well, in, that, in our case, we don't have uniqueness, but we are able to derive because we also impose it on top of other axioms, mm -hmm. let's say. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the idea is the same to have like actual properties. So essentially, we have something that, uh, that occurs certainty. with probability yeah. one, and then basically yeah. with the other axiom, we're able to certify both states and effects. Mm -hmm. In other words, so essentially, we can identify. So if something occurs with probability one on, with the, on a certain set effect, then we can identify it as being a certain state and something like that. Okay, but yeah. we haven't we haven't developed, let's say, in the direction you did in terms of state spacing and so on. So okay, this sounds like we it can could talk be more about that later. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think we have to thank Vicky again. Move on. Good uh, morning, everybody. And um, let me thanks for being here. And let me first thank the organizers for setting up such a nice uh, conference in person in such hard times. So I really appreciate their, their good work. And also, yeah, I'm very happy to be here to present this work. So this was done in collaboration with uh, two other people from the Institute of Quantum Science and Technology at the University of Calgary. And in particular, essentially, this work actually started with a sort of a casual conversation about the PT symmetric quantum theory and trying to make sense of it. So this work actually what I'm going to present focuses on finite dimensional systems. Uh, in fact, actually, the theory was originally developed for infinite dimensional systems and then later extended also for finite dimensional systems. So what's the idea behind it? So first of all, we should remember one of the fundamental postulates or axioms of uh, quantum theory, which is the fact that uh, quantum observables are described by a Hermitian operator. This is the standard description we have in all textbooks of quantum mechanics. Why is, let's say, um, why is this important? Well, this is important because uh, hermeticity tells us that we have a real spectrum, so the outcomes of measurements are real numbers as we want, and also we can define uh, expectation values of observables on states. So because, again, Hermitian matrices can be diagonalized, so there's, uh, there's more, and then essentially they can be diagonalized with orthogonal uh, projectors, spectral projectors, so that's a very good property we want in order to define expectation values of, of those. So the question was, for example, as in, we do in, in, the, in the case of foundations of quantum mechanics, whether we can relax some of these things, just as a mere curiosity, intellectual curiosity, but also because some of these Hamiltonians, actually, that are no longer Hermitian, arise, for example, in condensed matter physics, especially when people study the so-called Li-Yang singularities when they do statistical mechanics, so they're associated with phase transitions. And in, in, the, in those situations, there are some Hamiltonians that are not Hermitian, but um, what we have here is uh, the, the Hamiltonian is PT symmetric. This was originally proposed by Bender et al. So what's the, the gist of being uh, PT symmetric, that the Hamiltonian is PT symmetric? Is that it's, it's invariant under, peri uh, under parity transformation, which means a spatial reflection, and also time reversal. This is what they, they observed, at least in the model they found. And they also observed that in the infinite dimensional models they consider, these two conditions were enough to uh, have the reality of the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. So essentially, in this way, it seems that we can somehow bypass the um, hermeticity condition because, again, this PT symmetry ensures that we have a real spectrum and also, we can, in this way, uh, we have also diagonalization, and we can therefore define uh, expectation values of observables. Therefore, there was this proposal of, of enlarging quantum theory and extending it by considering observables that are not Hermitian, but rather PT symmetric, so we are actually relaxing. So in this, in this way, basically, they started developing a theory, and that's called PT symmetric quantum theory, and Maybe I'm not sure how familiar you are with this uh, field, but actually the, the literature in this respect is really broad, and there are like there's a huge number of papers in this respect. However, P 
people, when working with PT symmetric quantum theory, they soon realized that there are a lot of problems arising from this theory. For example, the law of total probability is not conserved because if the, um, the Hamiltonian is a longer emission, when you exponentiate it in order to get the so-called unitary evolution, which is of course no longer unitary, therefore the probability is no longer conserved. Uh, not, not a big surprise. Indeed, this was noticed also by the first, uh, by the first proponents of this uh, theory. But there are even weirder phenomena, like the theory becomes signaling. And therefore, this is very problematic, and then people like, thought of very different ways of fixing this problem. So maybe we have to uh, get rid of some states on, in the theory because the, some of them are signaling, so that's very strange. Not only that, there is also more information theoretic uh, strange phenomena. For example, the fact that entanglement, which is a phenomenon that is associate, associated with non-local agents in some sense, now, if I apply local unitaries, then suddenly the entanglement is no longer invariant. That is very strange. So, a lot of problems. And so people started to uh, try to find ways in order to circumvent or try even to fix these problems. And essentially, there are two proposed pathways. The first one, and most, where Mostafa Zadeh was actually the main proponent, but was actually also noticed by the first uh, proponents of uh, um, PT symmetric quantum theory, is that, well, if the Hamiltonian is not Hermitian, let's make it Hermitian so we are able to fix the problem of unitarity evolution. What do we do? Essentially, if it's not Hermitian, we define a new inner product on the same Hilbert space. And with this new inner product, suddenly the Hamiltonian becomes Hermitian again. Of course, we are a little bit cheating, if you want, in this sense, but in this way, essentially, many of the problems we, we had go away. However, there is another issue here, as we're going to, to see also later, that, as you can imagine, if we just redefine the inner product, this doesn't seem like uh, an extension, because we are essentially making, we are going back to the Hermitian picture. So, again, this sort of uh, uh, um, proposed way to fix this is also maybe a little bit problematic. But there is even a, an even wilder way to define this, which is by instead of uh, redefining a new inner product, to define an uh, indefinite inner product, whatever that means, in the sense because inner product is definitely not indefinite. So, in other words, there is a, something, there is a metric operator that is similar to the Minkowski space, but it, and, um, so it's indefinite, has some minus sign somewhere. And then, um, and also there is another inner product, so there is an indefinite inner product, let's call it this way, and also a true inner product, they are both defined and they are related to each other. The problem is that, first of all, this thing works only for infinite dimension, so it's a sort of a fixture that works only when you consider Hamiltonians that are operators in the space, uh, in the position representation, for example. And the other thing is that its consensus is not clear because in this case, some of, these, some of the states you find in those crying spaces are not even physical. So you have actually to consider, to get rid of some states, then you have to consider, um, for example, super selection sectors and avoid the, the superposition of some states, so it's actually quite problematic. And therefore, what we can say, the success and consistency of the proposals to fix uh, PT symmetric quantum theory is not definitely, it's not clear in this respect. Although people, I mean, wrote many papers trying to investigate and propose solutions to these things. Well, in fact, what's the main issue here? The main issue is that these people are not really taking the quantum foundation point of view. Because they are, what they are doing, they are extending quantum theory and trying to use more or less the same formalism without taking a principled approach. And actually, in, in this work, what we did was actually to apply quantum foundation to this field, which is mainly studied by condensed matter theories, because those people care about these PT symmetric quantum, uh, quantum extensions. And we tried to put them together and see what we could find out of that. So it's an example of uh, interdisciplinary or cross-fertilizations of, uh, of things, of, of fields. But before I explain what we did, let me uh, just uh, go into some basic definition so you can appreciate what we are talking about. Okay, so the PT symmetry is essentially an anti-unitary involution here for brevity instead of calling it PNT. 
pt, I'll just call it k, and uh, I, I have that k square is equal to 1 because it's an involution, and it's also anti-unitary, so it's conjugate linear. And then I say that an operator is pt symmetric if two things happen. First of all, it's diagonalizable, and this wasn't even clear in the original definition, so we actually had to infer somehow what the different papers meant in this respect, because there are slightly different versions of this definition. So essentially, diagonalizable, it commutes with this anti-unitary involution, so essentially that in this way we impose the, the symmetry at the level of the operator and also of the spectral projectors. On the other hand, if we want to pursue the modification of the inner product, what we do, we need to de redefine a new inner product, so we take the old one, which is here denoted with Brian Cat, and we introduce what we call a metric operator, which is a positive definite matrix eta, which is taken, let's say, which is inserted in the middle of the standard uh, bracket notation, just to denote, to introduce this new inner product. And in this respect, Instead of talking about a Hermitian observer, we talk about quasi-Hermitian observer, which means her, uh, observer that are Hermitian with respect to this new inner product. And this translates into this condition there, whereby essentially uh, an operator and its uh, adjoint, in this case it's meant to be like complex uh, conjugation and transpose, are related to each other by um, similarity transformation through the eta matrix, essentially. So this is the framework in which we are moving. And as I said earlier, essentially the problems in, in this field is that uh, all the works use the quantum form for something that is no longer quantum but rather an extension and they still think that, for example, vectors in the Hilbert space are actually states in the PT symmetric theory and this is how they generate all these sort of contradictions, problems and uh, problematic things. So actually we decided that maybe in order to make uh, things clear we took a more principal approach, and we, insert, we uh, use the GPTs, general probabilistic theories, in this point of view. So essentially, the idea was the following, that every system has a basic set of effects, and that, of course, I can build measurements out of these basic effects. For example, in quantum theories, these are um, just, um, for example, rank one projector, or orthogonal projectors, and in this setting, a state is nothing but a probability weight on those effects, so with a condition that if I sum those probabilities for effects arising in a measurement, I get one. And in particular, if we are dealing with operators, like in this case, or so square matrices on a certain vector space, uh, the uh, states, by a linearity argument, on, uh, take the, fo the following form. Essentially, they can be expressed as a trace of a matrix T mu, which is associated with a state, and then uh, applied, uh, multiplied with the effect. And in, in particular, in the quantum case, those t that T mu um, turns out to be a density matrix. Okay, so let's see what kind of results we found and in which setting we found them. So we consider a system where observables, instead of being Hermitian, are PT symmetric which means that we pick our set of effects to be the following. So we take projectors, but instead of imposing the hermeticity condition, we just take, impose it as a projector, and it commutes with this anti-unitary involution. It turns out that this is a very weak constraint, in fact. So this really leads to an extension to, of quantum theory from a certain point of view, at least from the point of view of, of observables. But when we enlarge the set of effects too much, then the set of states shrinks, and in fact, in this case, the observables are so many that there is only one state that's compatible with them. So then let's try to pursue the other way. So let's try to see if by inserting a new inner product we can maybe fix this. Maybe, not, maybe we don't get a trivial theory. And also, let's see also how results compare to the ones existing in the literature. And in this case, we talk about quasi-Hermitian theory. And with the point of view of, of, uh, from the point of view of GPTs, we actually find that a quasi-Hermitian system, where we redefine, is completely equivalent to a quantum system, which was already noticed using the formula of star algebra, but, we, but here we adopted a more, more, let's say, general approach. And finally, what, what happens if we combine eta hermeticity with PT symmetry? In this case, we get even worse, so we get that we actually get to a restriction of quantum theory, a real quantum theory specifically. The, the systems we obtain in this way are equivalent to real quantum systems. So to sum up, essentially what did we do? 
we use GPTs as a principal approach in order to understand the consistency of PT symmetric quantum theory. In this way, we could construct a state space recursion, and no one can object that these are actually physical states. And the thing is that these are the three things we found. If we require observables to be PT symmetric, then the theory is trivial. Quasi hermeticity, which means redefining an inner product and defining effects that are hermitian with respect to this inner, new inner product, we get something that is equivalent to quantum theory. Instead, if on top of quasi hermeticity we impose also PT symmetry, we get systems that are equivalent to real quantum ones. So, in other words, we get no extensions. In the first case, we get a trivial theory. In the second case, we get a theory that's equivalent to quantum. And the third case, we get a theory that's restricted. In the sense, it's just a real quantum system. So in other words, the current proposal, analyzed from the point of view of foundations, don't work well, and they don't lead to extensions. And we are left with this open question. So are there any other ways with which we can salvage this uh, PT symmetric quantum theory? Big open question. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Still got it. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any idea of who the next victims will be? <laughs> <laughs> of PTC, of, of in the same in the same area? Yeah, of the, of of the of same PTC. kind of. Uh, principled, uh, let's say, destruction. Yeah, um, I, I, I tend to think that probably, I mean, crying spaces seem to be very much complicated and uh, not so, their consist is not so clear. However, I mean, of course, I think that they can probably be ruled out in according to some other principle. The only difficulty we have is that essentially they require an infinite dimensional description of what's going on. And typically, GPTs are studied in the finite dimensional case. That's the only, uh, let's say, um, caveat, I would say, to, to do that. But essentially, we are kind of covering all sorts of approaches. OK, thank you. Yeah. Hi, I see yeah. how uh, commuting with an anti-unitary yields a relationship to time invariance, but I don't see where the parity symmetry comes in. Well, the parity symmetry um, essentially only come, let's say, came in it's not necessary we consider it for our work, because for the, our results, it's just enough that we have an anti-unitary involution. It was necessary for the first works, because when they defined the Hamiltonian, they had actually a concrete Hamiltonian, and they defined a concrete parity operator, and, a concrete, and then a concrete time reversal operator. So in this way, they were actually able to prove that the concrete Hamiltonian was PT symmetric. That's the only thing. But to derive the structural results, the only thing we need is that it's an anti-unitary involution. OK, one last question. Thanks for a nice talk. Uh, so you mentioned that the PT symmetric theories will have like problems like signaling and things like that. I was wondering if, uh, so what about uh, no cloning? What happens to no cloning in this kind of like theory? Uh, you know? I'm not sure people have studied that aspect, to be honest. OK. But yeah, that's an because interesting like, question. Because unitarity will be you know, affected, I assume that something will happen to no cloning. Yeah, the, the, problem, I mean, the main problem is that we can't even really answer the question because the theory is ill-defined the way they define it. So yeah, that's, <laughs> I'm not yeah. even sure how, <laughs> yeah. how we could answer the question in some sense. If <laughs> OK, let's thank Carla Marie again. Thanks. Thank you very much for the opportunity of being presenting here. And also thank you for for rescheduling my talk. Uh, unfortunate events happened this week. So let's go. I'm um, going to talk about these works that I developed with uh, Matty and my advisor, Annabelle Insigns. Um, and the motivation of this work is coming from the reconstruction paradigm. So um, we would like to replace axioms of, of quantum theory by physical principles because this would allow us to understand uh more about the the capabilities of information processing of quantum theory and i bring uh two examples here uh so in the first exa example i have a, a fully quantum bipartite scenario so alice has a share of a system and bob has uh, another Hilbert space with another state they have a, a combined state in this Hilbert space and for for this uh sort of fully quantum for, for the whole quantum theory, 
you have some successful axiomatizations uh, from physical or information axioms by using uh, generalized probabilistic theories, for instance. Uh, but then when you go for Bell scenarios or for, uh, for uh, black boxes or device independent stuff, then uh, it's not that easy to find uh, which are these uh, phenomena. I'm sorry, people, I'll just uh, wait a moment. Uh, Um, there you go. I'm sorry, uh, the cleaning lady just walked in. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, and, and you cannot have uh, this. Uh, you you have attempts, but you cannot have a, a fully uh, explanation of what are the behaviors in these scenarios that have a fully quantum explanation just by physical principles. Uh, there are also terms in between that are other important manifestations of non-classicality and are crucial for some information uh, processing tasks. So for instance, if you are non-classicality known in the literature as steering sometimes um, is an example that uh, somehow is portrayed in between the two scenarios that I just uh, uh, mentioned because it's it's like a bell scenario but some of the parties actually uh, describe their whole system and measurements by quantum theory and now instead of studying uh, only correlations or only quantum states you have a hybrid of these things that is in uh, we call an assemblage and this is uh, a mix of uh, like subnormalized quantum states um so the the goal of this presentation is that given a general framework for non-classical assemblages can we single out those assemblages who have a completely quantum explanation uh just by imposing mm, physical principles on 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 these generalized uh epr scenarios and particularly can we use device independent principles to help us in this task because this is something that is there it's available in literature so we we want to to use that for this task. And what does the answer teach us about CPR scenarios? So I gotta walk through some definitions. I I will try to not bore you to death, especially because you're all hungry and and craving for lunch. So uh, we define multipartite quantum assemblages or multipartite quantum EPR scenarios uh, as so we have uh, uh, multiple analysis and analysis. Each has uh, 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 an, an set of, a set of inputs and a set of outputs. And you have one Bob, which has a Hilbert space. And then uh, we say that this set of assemblages, which are these uh, subnormalized states again, uh, they have a quantum realization. If you also have a Hilbert space for all the Alice's, each Alice has a set of measurements on this Hilbert space and there is a, a, a shared quantum state in this in this Hilbert space, such such that the the uh, measurements of the analysis commute between different analyses. Uh, and then uh, you obtain the elements of the assemblage by analysis making measurements. Each analyst making a measurement on their share of the system, and then you're just discarding this uh, quantum system. Only Bob's quantum system is left. Uh, another important uh, set is the set of almost quantum assemblages, which is pretty much the same definition, but it's a relaxation of the quantum set, where I don't ask that uh, the measurements of the analysis uh, commute, but just that I can permutate, permutate them for this specific state that generates the elements of the assemblage. So uh, I somehow lose the... the uh, the notion of tensor product between the analysis, the, the uh, separability between the analysis. But for this particular uh, quantum state, uh, it looks like that. And why do I bother with almost quantum assemblages is because uh, there is uh, an immediate parallel with almost quantum correlations, 
uh, if I make the Hilbert space of Bob being trivial, then I have almost unknown correlations. And these correlations, they so far satisfy any device independent principles imposed over common cause boxes as far as I am concerned. Uh, also, almost quantum assemblages just have been used uh, as landmark for characterization of quantum assemblages from the outside before, for instance, to detect post-quantum APR non-classicality. And finally, it's a Linux program, so it's 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 a it's a convenient way of doing things. Okay, so our main idea of this work is that we can study assemblages not only by looking at these uh, subnormalized quantum states, but also by looking at lists of correlations, because what happens in APR scenario is that Bob is making uh, measurements on his share of the system, but what happens is that he knows he has a quantum state and he knows he has, um, uh, he makes uh, uh, specific quantum measurements that are tomographically complete. And then Bob and Alice sit together and they uh, use this data to reconstruct the, the state. So in this sense, uh, this is how we will import uh, device independent principles to assemblages. We will say that uh, an assemblage satisfies a physical principle when uh, this list of tomographically complete uh, data from Bob uh, making tomographic measurements on his share of the state satisfy this, this uh, physical principle. Uh, so for instance, the example we take to study this work is um, um, macroscopic uh, classicality motivated. So uh, consider a Bell scenario, you have a source sending a one, one share of like one particle for each lab, they, the labs, they, they make measurements and get some outputs. And it might be that Alice and Bob, when they sit together uh, in this microscopic version, they, they cannot find a classical explanation. But macroscopic uh, classicality principle is the one that when you have a macroscopic version of this experiment with multiple sources, and you have some, okay, some uh, symmetry of labeling the, the copies and some bound resolution on the detectors, then uh, Alice and Bob can come with uh, come up with a, with a classical explanation for this macroscopic distribution over the intensities in the detectors. And there is a established result that when uh, your, your notion of classicality is, is not contextuality, then the uh, correlations that have this uh, property that when you make the macroscopic version of the experiment, uh, this is non-contextual, are the almost quantum correlations. So with this result and our definition of uh, what it means when an assemblage satisfies a principle, we can say that uh, an almost quantum assemblage satisfy macroscopic non-contextuality because any any measurement that you make over an almost quantum assemblage will uh, will, will produce an almost quantum correlation uh, even if it's tomographic particularly if it's tomographic but then uh, the question comes up of is the converse true uh, it means if if there is uh, a a way of completely characterizing the set of almost quantum assemblages only by uh, a device independent principle like microscopic non contextuality because this would be this would be um, very um, a very happy find, finding uh, but it turns out that it's not that simple uh, there are already examples in literature showing that you have even a post almost quantum assemblages that produce fully quantum correlations actually even classic classical correlations so it's not uh, enough to look at some correlation, uh, check that this is satisfy the macroscopic non-contextuality principle and immediately say, okay, there is an, uh, an almost quantum assemblage behind this. So we need a stronger uh, device dependent version of macroscopic non-contextuality. So uh, consider that you have a nice tempo dosky rosen scenario with multiple Alice and, multiple, and, 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 and a single uh, Bob. Uh, and you consider the tomographic data associated to this scenario, then if this tomographic data um, uh, satisfy macroscopic contextuality, but also if this almost quantum realization of this tomographic data 
is achieved in a factorized Hilbert space, such that uh, Bob's Hilbert space is actually uh, the one associated with the assemblage. And Bob's measurements in this almost quantum correlation realization are uh, Bob's tomographic measurements, then you can say that uh, your assemblage is almost quantum. So uh, you need to bring this notion that Bob is fully characterized to, to conclude, uh, to, to, to fully characterize the almost quantum set of assemblages. So if you, you don't have uh, an underlying EPR scenario, if, if you have a macroscopic uh, non-contextual correlations, but they don't come from an EPR scenario, uh, or if Bob's measurements are not tomographically complete, then there is no way of establishing this relation and saying, okay, this is an almost quantum uh, assemblage. Uh, so we need uh, device-dependent principles to characterize assemblages, uh, or at least you need some uh, device-dependent incrementation of device-independent physical principles for characterizing assemblages. This is the les lesson we learn. Uh, and now there are still many details that need to be discussed with more um, care. So, uh, for instance, I'm talking about macroscopicality, but I'm also talking about quantum states, and this is a tricky venue to go. So, uh, it, this is a work in progress, but we we kind of want to check if this macro this device dependent version of macroscopic non contextuality can somehow be related with indeed the notion of EPR uh, classicality, macroscopic EPR classicality. But also there is uh, plenty of other um, uh, physical principles that can be explored, and uh, particularly explore the role of device dependent principles in. Uh, another known scenarios or taking toy theories that realize post quantum EPR inference, for instance, and, and uh, apply uh, device dependent principles on the scenario to see if we said, uh, we, we managed to buy, bound the set of quantum assemblages. And uh, that's it. Thank you. I hope I, I was clear and I'm sorry for the for the trouble. <laughs> it is a big responsibility. <laughs> Thank, thanks for the talk. Uh, when you define these multipartite assemblages, just like the kind of standard ones, you define it in terms of commuting analysis instead of like a tensor product uh -huh. analysis. Do you know if there's a difference? Because now we're kind of, I guess, fairly convinced that in the Bell scenario there is a difference. Do you know if there's a difference here? Uh, or, why, or why you choose this one? As far as I am concerned, as long as you're working with uh, finite dimensional Hubert spaces, this should be fine. Yes. So, so I think there should not be a difference, but uh, but I might be wrong. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I guess in, in the infinite dimensional case, this would be the question. Yeah, definitely. So, so this is a disclaimer, right? I I'm, I'm never approaching uh, infinite dimension Hubert spaces here. So. Okay. Which is also some nuance about macroscopicality in states that we are probably addressing to at some point. Okay, thanks. Um, as a follow-up comment, there is a paper by Miguel Navasquez and uh, David Perez Garcia that show that there is a difference. Like if you have that Bob is infinite dimensional, yeah, so that there is, and this was proven before the recent uh, breakthrough. Okay, I think we. I, th I see a lot of hungry people. So, uh, including myself. Vinny, thanks so much for joining us remotely. And, uh